All right. I think for the sake of time, we can like start the process so we have time for everything today. Uh, again, welcome everybody. My 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 name is JP Lopez. Um, I'm an immunologist in, in Cleveland at UH Rainbow Babies and UH Cleveland Medical Center in Case Western Reserve University. Uh, super excited to have you guys here for another one of our CIS monthly case conference webinars for the month of April. This is the last one before we hopefully see a lot of each other at CIS. So very excited about, about seeing a lot of you in St. Louis next month as well. Uh, just a reminder that this webinar is organized by the Early Career Immunologist um, Committee at CIS, um, trying to bring people to present interesting cases and, and, and create some, some discussion. It's, it's intended to be super interactive, so feel free to ask any questions in the chat. That's the only function we have over there. The only reminder is when you have the, the small two where you can select where you're sending the message to, just select everyone so that everyone can see your comments and your questions in the chat there as well, okay? Um, just another reminder that uh, for trainees, and we have two trainees over here today as well, CIS membership uh, is free for trainees, so, so you can feel free to apply at the CIS website and you can get part of the group and participate in fun things like, like we're doing tonight with CIS webinars. So without further ado, we'll start with our first case that is going to be presented by one of our internal medicine residents, Dr. Jim Riddler, uh, who is going to be applying to allergy immunology in the next cycle. So keep an eye on him um, on the interview trail. And the senior expert for this case is Dr. Nick Redder, who was kind enough to, to, to accept. Uh, being the senior expert in this in this case that we hope it's interesting. So feel free to ask any questions and I hope you guys like it and we're going to start. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction, JP. Um, uh, as, as you said, I, I'm Jim. I'm a second year resident at, at Case Western. Please uh, excuse the scrubs. I'm actually uh, working in the Mickey this evening. <laughs> I'm over I'm over on the uh, one of the side rooms. So um, but let me tell you about this case that we have uh, an, an elusive immunodeficiency a case of intestinal atresia combined immunodeficiency. Um, so our case, uh, we have a two-day-old um, uh, infant uh, presented to UH Cleveland Medical Center as a transfer from outside hospital after 36 hours of life with uh, inability to pass stools, abdominal distension, uh, low temp, and recurrent hypoglycemia. Um, birth history, so she was born at um, 35 weeks uh, in the six days to a 29-year-old G4P3 mother. Um, uh, Prenatal screens had been normal except for a uh, non immune cerebella and then group B strep positive um, status post treatment. Uh, and then APGARs at birth were uh, eight uh, and then nine. Um, physical exam on arrival was, um, you know. Largely um, normal. The really the only exception is that her her abdomen was was quite distended. Um, labs uh, were were interesting. So so you know in, in general you know CBC was okay. Um, all, all of her electrolytes were all all right, um, and then LFTs were okay. But notably, she had a decreased absolute lymphocyte uh, count, and her newborn screening was positive um, for for SCID. And then uh, because of the abdominal distension, um, we got some imaging um, initially. So this is uh, abdominal ultrasound, where uh, this red arrow is pointing to um, uh, small intestines, very, very large distended. Um, so they saw uh, circumferential bowel wall thickening, um, diffuse dilation, small and large bowel. Um, and then, you know, they, they even mentioned here, findings have been described in the setting of bowel atresia. Um, and, um, but they, they did mention solid organs were unremarkable. Um, Additional imaging, uh, so the chest x-ray you can see here, so you'll notice, you know, immediately very large gastric bubble, um, as well as areas um, here, and you can see here as well, just very um, uh, dilated loops of, of bowel. Um, so, you know, patient continued to have bouts of uh, non-bilious emesis uh, after feeds, um, dilated stomach bubble on x-ray, which we, uh, we saw. Uh, contrast enema showed uh, micro rectum, just three to four centimeters in length. Um, so surgery was consulted. Uh, they did uh, an exploratory laparotomy at day of life four. Um, they they showed you know, multiple areas of um, uh, atretic small bowel, uh, and so a lot of uh, bowel resections and reanastomosis. And here are some of the the sections you can see of of uh, atretic bowel. Um, and then um, some of the histology of this. So you can see, um, you know, this, this left image, this is a transection of the bowel where you can see in the lumen um, a large amount of meconium. 
And you can sort of appreciate some of the lamina propria of the bowel is, um, so there, there's a lot of um, uh, inflammation here. And then next to it uh, is another section of the bowel, but this is like totally atretic. Basically the inside is, is heavily, heavily fibrosed. Um, and so, you know, so some sections that, you know, there, there is a lumen, other sections, there's, there's just no lumen at all. It's totally uh, atretic. So, you know, with that, I wanted to ask you guys, so first off, what's your differential diagnosis? Well, just because because this message didn't go to the full group in the chat, um, we had we had one one of our attendees asking about absent thymus on chest X-ray. Terry, can you confirm if you were commenting or asking? They they didn't report it as such, and and we didn't we didn't see it in that imaging there. But he's trying to clarify the question. And then any other ideas you guys have in terms of differential diagnosis? C yes. C7A. Yeah. Gary was clarifying that he, that he commented that he did not see the sales sign on the chest x ray. I think at, at least our radiologist didn't pull on that one. So it was not like a call over there as well. But that's 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 interesting. And then we have several people, Nettie to everyone, and then some to, to, to our more private chat saying TPD7A, which sounds like a like a great uh like a great uh idea in the differential. Any other ideas? Anything else you guys can think of with this type of presentation? I know we give you away a lot of specific stuff. And in this case, there's there's a lot of less is more, but in case anybody has any other ideas with this with this presentation and the positive skids, positive skid screen and all of that. All right. If not, that's fine. We can move, yeah. we can move forward. Yeah, TTC seven A is definitely um, yeah very much so a, a consideration. So let me just go to the next slide here. So uh, important uh, immunophenotype here. So we saw um, you know normal B cell uh, count uh, with you know, very low IgM uh, and the normal IgG IgA you know, like likely uh, maternal antibodies, and then from um, our uh, T cell so so low uh, total T cell count. Uh, very low CD8, um, and then um, low CD4, uh, but you know a, a high CD4 to CD8 ratio. Um, normal uh, NK cells, and then there was actually a normal mitogen response. Um, and then importantly, um, the family history for this patient. So it's a Schwarzenegger Amish family, um, and the patient had a cousin that actually had a you know, blockage of intestine, um, you know, from a, a rare genetic condition at birth. Cousin noted to have intestinal intrusia, um, IgM less than 10, marked positive CD8 T cells, similar to, to our patient, um, and underwent um, some screen. So a primary immune deficiency panel that showed, um, you know, included TTC7A, um, which was non-diagnostic. Uh, the cousin passed away within the first month of life, um, had gone um, a hospice um, with similar presentation. Um, and then just to show you guys, um, you know, an idea of the, the the pedigree for this family. So our patient is here uh, you know, with the air, and this was the cousin that had passed away. So you can see a, a good deal of consanguinity um, with, within this within this uh, family tree. Um, so based on that, any any other ideas for for differential diagnosis? Actually, Jim, can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah, a great presentation. Um, so it's interesting to me, and I'm actually really struck by the fact that this that this infant had the newborn screening done. Um, was the was the infant born at home, or were they born in a hospital? I Do believe you know? I, so. I believe it was um, a local. Um, uh, I know they presented from from Worcester Hospital. I'm not actually sure where the patient was born. It, it, they they presented to Worcester Hospital very shortly after birth. I'm not sure if they were actually born at Worcester Hospital or if it was at home. Okay, I think no. if I remember well, she was born at the hospital, actually, Nick. Um, I don't know if there was like any suspicion of complications or something like that, but it, you know, it, as far as I remember, it was not a home birth. Uh, she was there like locally closer to Canton because that's where they lived. And then very soon was transferred to up to Cleveland due to the findings they did on the extension and all that stuff. 
Yeah, that's that's really remarkable. A lot of the families that I cared for, if they did not have, like this family did, if they didn't have a significant medical family history, medical complexity in infants, oftentimes they'd be born at home. They wouldn't do any newborn screening. And we had to kind of really get to the midwives to um, encourage the families to send the newborn screening, including SCID. Um, so that, that was that was really remarkable to me when um, when you shared the case. Very interesting. And I mean, I'm grateful to see that they did, even though, you know, it's uh, the child was sick at presentation. Yeah. And I don't see any other ideas in the chat in terms of diagnosis. I know, I know, I know Jim presented uh, on the family history, the genetic test results for the cousin, just because the thesis 7A was in everybody's, in everybody's head as, as, as in you guys, as a suggestion. For the cousin, it was negative. Uh, it was done a few few years ago, but covered for TTC seven a. Any other ideas of what could be going on over here? And we we didn't say yet. Uh, we didn't comment on TTC seven a specifically on this patient, but just just gauging if anybody else has any other ideas from a genetic standpoint. So Neil Neil is asking any weird hair findings? No. Pretty, pretty in, in on, on par with age, but nothing, nothing to in or 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 anything in that range or changing in color or, or anything like that. No major dysmorphic features as well. No. Yeah. All right. Okay. I think we'll, we'll 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 do this one very quickly today, guys. Okay. We can we could but we can continue so we can talk about about what came next. Okay, um, so it turns out, so, um, you know, the genetics uh, was, was consulted and we, we got, um, you know, Sanger uh, sequencing showed, um, you know, this homozygous uh, uh, mutation uh, in the PI4KA gene, uh, demonstrating a gastrointestinal defects and immunodeficiency syndrome type two. Um, you know, we, we didn't do broader genetic testing uh, due to, you know, specifically family request. Um, but, you know, this, so this confirmed our diagnosis. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, despite surgical fixation, um, patient didn't have any restoration of bowel function, uh, continued to have large uh, NG output. Um, and so you know, discussed a lot of uh, additional potential treatment options, uh, TPN and, you know, multi-organ transplant, small bowel, potentially liver and, you know, stem cell transplant, but ultimately family uh, elected for hospice and uh, patient passed away at around uh, one month of age. Um, so I just wanted to sort of share, you know, this this sort of um, you know, complex um, with you guys. So I, as everybody mentioned, uh, TTC seven A. Um, so it exists sort of in the in this complex with um, uh, PI four K three alpha, which is uh, encoded by the, the PI four K gene, uh, and then uh, uh, FAM one twenty six. Uh, it ultimately helps to catalyze uh, the the conversion of phosphatidyl inositol to the uh, PI four P. Uh, this is all done at, at the, the plasma membrane, and this is uh, extremely important for um, a, a lot of processes, including cellular polarity, cell survival, actomyosin contractility. Um, and you know, what we've seen is that any sort so, you know, in a lot of, um, you know, mouse models, any sort of like global loss of function of uh, PI4K3 alpha is, is embryologically lethal, but um, some uh, hypomorphic uh, mutations um, uh, ha have been shown in the literature and um, you know, results in uh, this um, uh, the, the gastrointestinal uh, defects and immunodeficiency syndrome two, uh, type, type one being the, the, the TTC7A um, uh, deficiency. Um, so again, this... Uh, Gastrointestinal defects, immunodeficiency syndrome two. Um, it's characterized by multiple intestinal atresia. Frequently, you'll see uh, third trimester polyhydramnios, um, uh, a, a lot of abdominal distension, bilious vomiting, inability to pass meconium uh, early in life, a, a flamed, inflamed atretic bowel, and then um, variable immunodeficiencies. So, um, you know, T cell lymphopenia, which we saw, you know, at other patients, they've seen moderate uh, B and NK cell lymphopenias. And our patient, the uh, NK uh, cell count was, was normal. And then uh, agamic globulinemia. Um, and you know, importantly, uh, surgical fixation hasn't really restored the gut function. Um, it's, it's, you know, an, an immediate surgical fix, but it, it doesn't, uh, you know, the gut never really has recovered. Um, and you know, important to think about because it's it's often you know missed on uh, targeted gene panels. Um, and then just to show you, so so this is from uh, Salter et al. Uh, it shows um, 
you know, a, a series of patients. Uh, so up, up here, you can sort of see the, this complex, like I showed in one of the you know, cartoon image in one of the previous slides, where you can see uh, PI4KA uh, um, with uh, TT7B uh, and then FAM126. Uh, and you can see um, this is where areas of mutations um, have uh, have been seen uh, in, in previous patients. And you can see sort of, you know, what the um, uh, uh, amino acid residue um, uh, is, and it, you know, it, it basically seems to be involved in the um, the binding of uh, the PI4KA with uh, TTC7B, um, and so you know, su suggesting that basically a lot of these these mutations may be inhibiting the formation of this complex. Um, and so, you know, some things to think about is you know maybe um, you know some some extrapolations from from TTC7A. You know, so we know in TTC7A uh, immunodeficiency, you know, we frequently see you know a lot of um, T cell lymphopenia. At B and NKs is variably reduced, um, which you know we, we've seen here. There there are some cases where NK cells are, are lower in, in people with this uh, this disease, not in our patient particularly. And then mitogen pr proliferation was is reduced sometimes in TTC7A. Wasn't in our patient here. Um, there's some evidence that um, stem cell uh, transplant can improve, uh, even if it's sort of just, just partially uh, immune function of some of these patients, but it's still overall a relatively poor um, prognosis. Um, you know, a lot of these patients um, are, die early in life uh, due to GI complications and, and infections. Um, and you know, all of the surgical interventions that are often necessary to prolong life come with a, a lot of complications in and of themselves, short bowel syndrome, um, and you know, uh, oftentimes uh, liver disease due to the, necess uh, the necessity for TPN. And the, the stem cell transplants have actually only really rarely been successful. Um, you know, really only, you know, four patients really, you know, uh, reported to, to, you know, really prolong life uh, much with this, this stem cell transplant. So um, definitely a really severe disease to um, have, in, have in the back of your mind, especially when uh, TTC7A um, you know, gene mutation is, is negative on, on the, uh, the, C, uh, the, the panel. Uh, and there's you know, maybe some potential for these row kinase inhibitors and um, you know, normalizing apicobasal polarity and epithelial cells. So you know, possibly a future um, uh, treatment um, mechanism, but um, it's you know, not not really there yet, unfortunately. So a lot of severe disease, unfortunately, for these patients. Um, thank thank you guys for listening. I'd be happy to happy to take any questions. Thanks, Jim. This this was great. So. As as I as we open the chat for anybody that has any questions for for Jim and for us about the case, uh, definitely as 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 Jim stressed um, really well, this this is a typical in some ways, right? Because it's a very limited type of immunophenotyping and 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 a very limited approach from a genetic standpoint, and and part of that comes from the particularities of the Amish population, the out of pocket costs, several of those things as well. So. So, like, really be curious to see Dr. Ryder's um, Dr. Ryder's comments on on all of these different layers uh, in, in in as a simplistic approach as possible, since there are so many layers, Nick. Right? Yeah. No, JP. Thanks so much, and Jim. Again, really wonderful case presentation. Um, I actually wanted to hear a little bit more about the kind of the shared decision making with the family, and um, I'll. I'll preface that by saying that, you know, when I was working at the clinic for special children in uh, Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, you know, m most Amish don't go to, or, or Mennonites go to school beyond the eighth grade. So their, their science education is very much lacking compared to, you know, the general population. Yet they, they are often incredibly interested in science, especially um, health and biology as it pertains to their families. Um, so they often know a lot about genetics. Um, they they have a, a book called the you know the Amish book or the Fisher book they call it, and they can trace back through multiple lineages who was sick with what and what you know um, who was related to who. And so we would often actually even ask one of our uh, front desk workers who was Amish, 
hey, track this family down for the Fisher book. And, and she would come back in like 15 minutes and say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're related to this person, that person, this person. And you'd be able to say, well, that, that family had these disorders. And um, so there's just this kind of intense interest in genealogy and health. Um, and, and they don't typically make snap decisions about their health care. They, they typically do want some dialogue involved. So I'm curious how that went for you as you're explaining you know, the uh, the PI4K and uh, what's known about that and, and how that factored into kind of their decision to have surgery and maybe get palliative care involved and, and so forth and so on. Jim, you want me to help on this one? Just because yeah. I, know, I know you're not able to go to like the family meetings and some of, some of those things as well, but it, but it was very interesting as, as we were like even commenting before the, the webinar started, I was really impressed by 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 going along with what you're saying, the level of knowledge that the family had, uh, and also the level of involvement they wanted for the rest of the family. So the family meeting involved not only the parents of the child, but also the parents of both parents, so so the the four sets of grandparents and the parents of the cousin that was deceased with a very similar presentation a couple of years before because they wanted them present and they were curious to know what could be going on and all of that so our first suggestions they were okay there was a long discussion initially and that was outside of the family meeting into doing even a phenotyping and they said to do it as 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 limited as possible so we, that, that's why we got flow and function but not a lot else um but then in terms of the other decisions when they brought everybody into play and to and the decision to send genetic testing their approach was personally contrary to to what happened with the cousin that they didn't want any type of like more expanded panel or or whole exome or whole genome or anything that could become more expensive which i find interesting because you're admitted in the NICU at an hospital like that so it's you, cost is already a big big problem at that point right after several days in major surgeries but of course we we're like super respectful in that discussion and kind of like where we met halfway was we said okay we think this is a presentation that goes along with this combination of the intestinal atresia and, and the possible immunodeficiency and um the cousin was very closely related because 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 both sets of parents were first degree cousins as well actually but that like the father was uh, the father was first cousin of the mother and the mother was first cousin of the father of the other kid as well so there was really really a lot of consanguinity over there um were agreeable that because the tc 7 a didn't seem to be the cause of what was going on in the family that we could try the other gene that had been described it was really a shot in the dark in the sense that there was a single paper published by uh in, in a neurosurgery journal where 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 they occasionally mentioned the fact that there's also combined immunodeficiency and then there's like somebody from immunology in the case but it was mostly people from neurosurgery because of the brain changes that are associated with pi4k mutations as well so it, it what was defined with family because at that's at that point they have not decided in terms of management but what they wanted to do was if we find this variant we can stop there and try to help you as much as possible with prognosis and management because there's not a lot of info out there if it's not, then they would be agreeable to at least send for 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 uh, for an Invita AI panel to try to look at other genes, including TT7A. Yeah, that's that's great. No, thanks for that that backstory, JP. That, that's really fabulous. I mean, I found that in working with these communities, that they they, you know, they do what kind of what, what we all should do um, if we knew what the trans if there was real transparency of healthcare costs, and that is you know, what's the risk benefit of anything and everything? And they really look at this in granular detail, like, you know, what's the benefit of doing whole genome sequencing or whole exome sequencing? What's yeah. the yield? And they would press us quite um, sternly um, so that we really had to, like you did, um, you know, bring bring numbers and facts to them. Um, there was definitely very little fuzzy math um, with them because they wanted to, to understand gran the granular costs and the benefits that that might uh, or, or lack thereof to, to their family um, in terms of diagnostic testing, um, you know, procedures, transplant. But I, but I found that they overall, what was, what was very interesting is although they, they don't drive cars, they don't have cell phones, um, you know, they would have a whole exome sequencing done or they would undergo bone marrow transplants and so forth because the value of the individual to the family um, you know, supersedes any kind of, uh, you know, kind of technological intervention. Um, so they, they see that as a benefit, even though they, they 
don't engage in typical practices that are common to us. Yeah. So, Thank you for that. Cause that's, that's, that's really interesting. And I think even from a management standpoint, I mean, for me, it will never stop being tough when the decision is for hospice in a newborn or an infant like it was, because you can't even imagine the, the, the layers of, of complexity that go through the parents' brains to decide this. But honestly, they were like that family meeting lasted two hours with them asking very good questions in terms of management and prognosis. And again, like Jim presented, the, the few data we have is extrapolation from TT7A, which is not great. And even in those cases, sometimes it means combined small bowel or liver and bone marrow transplant with their social situation as well. It would be like a really rough one to, to, to go forward, even if you were trying for everything. So, so in the end, we always respect the decision and and it may end up being the fair one, right? It's like the majority of the patients that were described. Yeah. Well, the last thing I'll say, I know we're coming up on our half of the webinar, the end of that, but, you know, I also want to congratulate you both on really finding, I think, a gene that hasn't been brought to medical attention to the centers that principally care for these patients uh, as primary care physicians. And the Das Deutsch Clinic there in Middlefield, Ohio, uh, the Clinic for Special Children in Strasburg, Pennsylvania. I know there's an Indiana clinic now. I at least looked at the websites for Strasburg Clinic and Dodge George Clinic, and they don't list this gene yeah. amongst their, their patients. So I think they, they will really appreciate what you've learned. And, yeah. um, you know, they'll be able to counsel those patients when they come in and, and have an abnormal newborn yeah. screen TREC assay that this could be, you know, uh, PI4KA amongst yeah. others, other candidate genes. In the process of that. So I agree with you. Super important for sure. Yeah. Great work. Great work. Awesome. Great Thank you very much, yeah. Gene. Great presentation. Thank you, Nick and Jungi. We'll let you guys go on for the second case. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, James. That was a really great presentation. Um, and hi, everyone. Um, it's my great pleasure to um, lead the second half of the um, webinar. So my name is Jenny Shin. I'm assistant professor at Yale School of Medicine. And um, today's presentation will be by Dr. Um, Kaylee Wang, um, who is our first year allergy and clinical immunology fellow here at Yale um, School of Medicine. And um, it is also our great pleasure to have Dr. Nee Romberg um, as our senior expert for the case. And um, Dr. Romberg is also a professor of pediatrics at um, UPenn and also clinician at um, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. So um, without further ado, um, I'm going to pass to um, Caitlin for the presentation. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, so our presentation is entitled A Clinical Dilemma, Transplant Hesitancy, and Life-Threatening Illness. Um, there are no disclosures. I'll start with the first of two cases. Um, this is a patient that presented to an outside institution. Um, he's a 24-year-old male who presented to the ED with generalized weakness, palpitations, and shortness of breath. He had a known history of G6PD deficiency and was transfusion dependent uh, since the age of two, uh, had a notable family history of a brother who died at age one due to an infection. Um, on presentation, um, he was uh, slightly tachycardic and had uh, a slightly low blood pressure, but otherwise uh, physical exam was unremarkable, had no evidence of bleeding, uh, but did have a profound anemia of 2.7. Um, with the low white counts as well, but no evidence of hemolysis um, on further studies. So he underwent a bone marrow biopsy, which showed cell hypercellularity with megaloblastic changes and pale pink intranuclear inclusions, uh, which was consistent with parvovirus B19 infection. So at that time, um, the cause of the severe anemia was thought to be multifactorial, um, he had the underlying G6PD deficiency um, and now with the superimposed parvovirus uh, infection. Um, he again presented uh, a second time with a similar presentation, so further workup was done and was found to have a low IgG level um, as well as an elevated IgA and IgM level. Um, so this IgG deficiency was uh, thought to be an immunocompromising state that allowed for a recurrent parvo B19 infection and had associated pure red cell aplasia. And so ultimately he was started on IVIG monthly and became transfusion independent. 
So we'll now fast forward 15 years later, um, we'll have, we have our second patient, case two, who is actually the grandson of the patient in case one, uh, as shown on our pedigree. Um, he, this patient, uh, case two, is a six-month-old male who presents with severe hypoxemia to our institution. Um, he had a notable history of failure to thrive. He was um, falling off the curve at his six-month well child check and was having poor feeding. Um, he ultimately uh, developed respiratory failure, required intubation, um, and ultimately went on VV ECMO for support. Um, his workup um, during that hospitalization was notable for pneumocystic gervecci pneumonia and also CMV viremia. On lab findings, um, he had a normal hemoglobin but had thrombocytosis as well as a remarkable leukocytosis at 48,000 with a lymphocytic uh, predominance. Um, immunoglobulin levels were checked at this time, and he was noted to have low IgG level at 109, um, normal IgA and elevated IgM at 503. Um, he had a flow cytometry that was noted for elevated CD4 T cells, um, normal CD8 cells, um, elevated uh, CD19 B cells, and absent switch memory B cells with normal NK cells. So at this time, I'll uh, pause for um, differential diagnoses from the audience. Yes, please um, feel free to um, write in the chat um, or you can. Uh, I'm not sure whether you can speak out, but you know, please share your differentials. Yeah, I see switch to defect. CD40 ligand, uh, a hyper IgM. Yes, great differentials. TTC7A in view of test nor atresia. Okay. All right. I, yeah, I mean, I guess we got many differentials along the switch to defect. Um, so, I, um, Kaylin, you, I think you can continue. Okay. So, um, yeah, so some of the ones we also came up with, hyper IgM syndromes, um, SCID was consideration given the opportunistic infection. Um, CVID, he would be a bit early to be diagnosed with a, um, on differential. And then HIV um, to make sure to rule out, um, and then can consider just defects in the NF-kappa B uh, regulation pathways. So um, as many of you have guessed, um, the patient does have CD40 ligand deficiency. Um, in a, uh, We were able to show that um, there was decreased CD40 ligand um, expression uh, in an in vitro uh, T cell assay. Um, so in the red line um, is the unstimulated um, CD40 or CD4 T cells um, and the expression uh, of CD40 ligand. And when stimulated, um, shown in the blue line, um, you can see that the healthy control has adequate expression. The mother who is the carrier has a decreased expression of CD40 ligand, and then the patient has absent CD40 ligand expression. Um, genetic um, sequencing was completed, and um, he was uh, the patient was found to have a pathogenic variant in CD40 ligand gene. Um, and the same uh, variant was also found in the grandfather, the patient from case one. Um, but um, so the patient, the grandfather actually is uh, doing well on IVIG alone and has not been transplanted. So just to review the pathogenesis of CD40 ligand deficiency. Um, so in this picture, there, um, the B cell is presenting a peptide on its MHC class two to a T cell receptor. Um, and this leads to activation of the CD4 T cell leading to expression of CD40 ligand. And the expression uh, or the interaction between CD40 ligand and CD40 leads to uh, class switch recombination and somatic hypermutation allowing for production of IgG, IgA, and IgE. Um, and in addition, CD40 ligand and CD40 interaction is important um, in uh, T cells interacting with other antigen-presenting cells like macrophages and dendritic cells. 
um, which help with T cell proliferation and differentiation. And so this leads to a combined immunodeficiency picture um, that we see in CD40 ligand deficiency. So some of the clinical presentations include uh, opportunistic infections um, like pneumocystic gervecci, Canada, CMV, cryptosporidium. Uh, patients will have recurrent sinopulmonary and GI infections, CNS infections, as well as non-infectious neurologic complications, uh, neutropenia, autoimmunity, osteopenia, which can present in childhood, and an increased risk of malignancy. So um, back to our case, um, the patient was started on IVIG um, and uh, was put on PCP prophylaxis and CMV prophylaxis. At that time, transplant was discussed, but unfortunately there was no match for the patient. Um, and as time went on, the patient um, unfortunately had poor adherence to therapies and had multiple missed appointments. So it was challenging to um, closely follow. Um, at four years old, he did present again to the institution um, and was hospitalized with a left lower lobe pneumonia. Um, he was uh, empirically treated at that time for a bacterial pneumonia and PJP as uh, the bronchoscopy was deferred at the time. And then again, at eight years old, um, he presented again uh, to the ED with diffuse lymphadenopathy. Um, so the patient had a subacute history of intermittent fevers for the past three to four weeks. He had a chronic dry cough, fatigue. He had unintentional weight loss of five pounds over three months. And on exam, he had notable palpable mobile enlarged nodes in his cervical chain, axilla, inguinal regions. Um, on lab findings, he had a leukocytosis of 25. He, had, he was anemic and had a thrombocytosis. His IgG was 563 uh, with an uh, IgM of 382. He had transaminitis um, as well as an elevated ESR. Uh, uric acid and LDH were normal. And then viral studies were completed. Adeno, EBV, CMB, parvovirus, and HSV were all negative. On CT chest, he did, they did find a large anterior mediastinal soft tissue mass that extended into the retroperitoneum. And on a PET, uh, C, PET scan, he was noted to have diffuse lymphadenopathy in the cervical region, hilar, mediastinal, um, inguinal um, region. So um, at this time, we'll also pause to see uh, what thoughts the audience had in terms of differentials. Yeah, I mean, this was a very scary finding um, for us, and I, I want to um, see what will be differential diagnosis by the audience. So we have um, LPD, AICAD, and also I guess there was a question about the match. Um, was there a hepro-identical donor? And you know we could consider um, doing the um, transplant. Yeah, that's actually a you know the question that we wanna discuss at the end um, regarding how we should manage this patient because um, you know it wasn't just a match and actually we did find a match at this time, um, but with his you know, being not very compliant with the care, you know, there was a lot of discussion whether we should go ahead or not. So I want to hold on to that question a little bit longer to the later um, when we want to have a full discussion about that. Um, yeah, there could be the infection as per virus. Um, yes. And then so there was a question. Um, did the grandfather really have um, G60PD, um, X-linked disorders of, um, was it presented and actually um, XLHIGM? Um, so it was, um, so the patient, the grandfather actually being followed by um, in New York and he was um, diagnosed with G6PD by the, the hematologist there. And according to us, um, we did a genetic exam patient did have um, hyper um, the CD40 like deficiency. And NTM and 
Bartonera can give this much uh, in private. Oh, that's good to know. Yeah, so I mean, I think, you know, we, it was really infection versus um, malignancy. And I think we were really scared that whether patient has lymphoma. Um, so um, I guess, Caitlin, you can go ahead. Okay, um, so a lymph node biopsy did reveal that the patient had cryptococcus neoformans, so disseminated cryptococcal disease. Um, so further workup uh, was done, CSF studies and MRI brain showed that he did not have CNS involvement of cryptococcal disease. Um, he received a 40-day course of amphotericin B and flucytosine and followed by eight-week course of oral fluconazole. And our infectious disease group recommended that he continue on lifelong maintenance fluconazole. So now the patient is currently nine years old. Um, he's continuing on IVIG and PJP prophylaxis. Um, and he has met with our transplant team um, and there is a potential matched unrelated donor. However, the family is very hesitant against um, transplant. They're worried against complications. Um, and so we have connected the family uh, with the Hyper IgM Foundation to help uh, connect with other families who have undergone uh, the process. But um, we wanted to discuss um, stem cell transplant for uh, CD40 ligand deficiency. It is the only definitive cure. Um, and in general, our outcomes for inborn errors of immunity are favorable. Um, some considerations um, include um, the intensity of the preconditioning, um, and of course, there are still, unfortunately, still complications associated with transplants. So I'll just review briefly two uh, papers looking at outcomes of uh, patients with CD40 ligand deficiency who have undergone transplant. Um, this is the first paper by De La Morena and others, uh, which was published in Jackie, but it looked at um, long-term outcomes of 176 patients who uh, had um, X-linked hyper IgM syndrome. They collected data um, from 28 international clinical sites. Um, these patients were diagnosed between 1964 and 2013, and 38% of them had received transplant. Um, they found that for all patients, uh, the median survival time was uh, 25 years. Um, but uh, in this study, they did not find any statistical significance um, in the survival probability and between those who had received transplant and those who had not. But they did find that there was an improved quality of life for patients who underwent transplant. And um, they did note that the risk associated with transplant decreased uh, for those who were diagnosed in the late 80s and which became statistically significant um, for those in the diagnosed in the late 90s with a hazard ratio less than one. And they also noted that people who uh, were transplanted at a younger age and did not have liver disease fared better. Um, the second study um, looked at um, outcomes of 130 patients um, who received transplants for CD40 ligand deficiency. This was uh, in by Furua and others, um, also published in Jackie. Um, they looked at uh, patients who were transplanted at 36 um, international um, transplant centers between the years 1993 and 2015. Um, and one of their main findings was that they found that those who had received transplant under the age of 10 um, fared uh, better than those who received transplant after uh, they were 10 years old. Um, and they also noted that those who were transplanted um, in the, after the year 2000 um, also did better than those who were transplanted prior to 2000. Um, and this graph looks at the overall survival um, of patients with who underwent transplant at ages or uh, five years after the transplant. And this is just their visual abstract. Um, they also found that there was um, a better outcome in transplant in patients who did not have organ damage before transplant. Um, overall survival and disease-free survival were uh, better if they used a myeloablative regimen or if they were transplanted closer to the time of diagnosis. Um, and lastly, they found that those who had matched sibling donors used myeloablative regimens and used bone marrow derived stem cells had better event free survival. Um, and event free survival, they defined 
um, as those who uh, did not have um, graft failure or needed um, a second transplant or had um, more significant GVHD. So just some of the complications um, to consider for transplant include toxicities from the chemotherapy. Um, certainly infection is um, always have to be aware of as it's the most common cause of mortality after transplant, um, some of which we can mitigate with antimicrobial prophylaxis. There's the risk of uh, graft failure or mixed chimerism where there's a decrease um, circulating amount of donor cells resulting in disease. And of course, GVHD, which um, we can also uh, prophylax against as well. Um, and I'll just mention briefly that uh, gene therapy is an ongoing area of discussion or investigation. Um, there are two um, different approaches, Talon mediator CRISPR-Cas9 with the adeno-associated viral vector. Um, and this, this is just being investigated and it's not um, readily available for patients yet. So um, these are the questions we wanted to, um, for the audience to help uh, participate in, but uh, would you recommend a transplant for this patient? Is disseminated cryptococcal infection a contraindication to transplant? And if the patient does not um, get transplanted, what are your recommendations for long-term follow-up in terms of surveillance of cryptococcus and um, antimicrobial prophylaxis going forward? Yeah, so Neil, do you wanna give us some comments about um, our um, questions about this patient? I know you have been knowing this family for a long time, right? Uh, yeah, th thank you, Jenny. Um, uh, kind of great, great presentation. It, it is a real a, a real medical mystery that uh, spanned you know, multiple generations and multiple decades. Um, uh, I, I guess, um well, one one thing I would would ask you um uh Caitlin is um is, is what do you think about that original diagnosis in, published in 2005 um they didn't know about the diagnosis of CD40 ligand deficiency at that time and I think that they were um looking for a unifying diagnosis um it involved G6PD and parvovirus B19. Do you, do you think that that um, holds water? Do you think that that's a, a likely explanation for his problems? Um, in terms, I think the there are reports of um, like recurrent or chronic parvovirus infection in patients with CD40 ligand deficiency and other immunodeficiencies. So I think it this current diagnosis, I think, probably explains it a little bit better because it explains the immunoglobulin levels. So, but in 2005, they um, they knew the patient was IgG deficient, but um, I think in 2005, we, did, did we know of the, the gene for CD40 ligand deficiency? Oh, did the scientific community? I guess they know. <laughs> Well, I know that there's definitely other patients. It sounded like there are patients that were diagnosed in the sixties. Yeah, I, I, I'm trying to think. Patient? Yeah, like the genetic cause of CD40 ligand deficiency. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think. And it, I think it, I think it was discovered in the, in, in the I think in '99. Um, Nick, do you know? Yes, I see your comments here. The city for it like a non in 1990s. Yeah, exactly. Good, good, yeah, I'm good. not sure about timing of the gene. That's a good question, Neil. Yeah, you look yeah, at us it, it, was, um, it was really interesting. It was, you know, four, four groups that basically published back to back to back to back um, to back. They did four backs, um, all describing this at the same time, which I think happens in science sometimes that, you know, basically um, uh, the mouse. The, the molecular biology comes through, the mouse biology um, describes the phenotype, and then all the clinical immunologists are like, I have a patient like that, let's let's look for that gene. Um, and, and I think since all that happened in, in, in 1999, it, it's just unfortunate that, that nobody thought to, to see why this patient was hypogammaglobulinemic in 2005. Mm -hmm. um, I guess 
um, uh, the other thing that I would say that was unusual with this case, Caitlin, is um, that patient made it, I think, 25 years of age, really before he saw um, a hematologist. And I, I guess I don't think he saw an immunologist until he saw me. Um, uh, but um, he, he really didn't have any opportunistic infections other than parvovirus B19 in his life, did he? Yeah, especially after he started IVIG, he'd been doing really well. So I met him when he was like a 45 year old. Sure. And he has, I mean, he's not the most compli compliant patient either. Like he misses doses here and there, but still he's very healthy, like, you know, doing really well. Yeah, and I mean, yes, yeah. when I had met him, he, he had just come out of um, prison. He was incarcerated for eight years mm -hmm. um, without IVIG without any bacterium prophylaxis. Um, and I was somewhat skeptical that somebody with CD40 ligand deficiency could survive in an incarcerated setting without any um, immune protection. Um, and I wonder if that kind of can feed into skepticism about hematopoietic stem cell transplant for a family who have a relative who did so, did so well, despite the worst circumstances you can imagine. Um, but I guess that they have another, I guess his younger brother died at, at, a, at a young age too. Um, it does make you always wonder like in the same family who share so many of the same genetics, like how can you have these two cases that are, they're so disparate. Um, I see, I'm seeing a, um, comment here from, from, uh, about a somatic reversion. Um, that's always, that, that's, a, that's a great thought. That's a, um, that's certainly a, a way in which a disease can be hypomorphic to have um, somatic mutations either back to, to wild type or to, to a more, more benign um, variant. But um, I, I believe that we did CD40 ligand induction on the patient's T cells and there was like zero CD40 ligand. I'm sure you've repeated it, Jenny. Yeah, I repeated when he was like 45 when I met him, and yeah, he still doesn't have any CD40 ligand. Is he on Bactrim? Yeah. Hmm? Do, you know, do you know if he's on Bactrim prophylaxis? He's not. He's actually not. He's yeah. he's not even getting IVIG monthly. So so that's that's the whole thing about you know Kamari. Um, you know, people thought that he's going to be doing fine too, but he's been having life-threatening infection three times already, and um, now he's going to be turning 10-year-old in July. So we really want to make a decision whether he should get transplant or not. And the parents are becoming a little more open-minded about transplant. And um, But it's also from the physician side that they are very non-compliant, non-reliable family that is it safe to transplant him. So... Um. Yeah. Does he, has he had any siblings? No, no siblings that I know of. Yeah. yeah. I guess the, the other thing that comes to mind, um, Jenny and Caitlin, is I've, I've not seen cryptococcus before in CD4 ligand deficiency, but I, I know there are a bunch of published cases. Um, and typically, we, we don't prophylax with, for, with antifungals for CD4 ligand deficiency. Should we be? I'm not sure. That's an open ended question. Um, does anybody in the chat um, uh, uh, um, are at centers who do prophylax for, for fungals, uh, antifungal stuff in CD40 ligand like you would for a CGD patient? Crickets. I haven't, I haven't <laughs> yelled, but I think it's a great question. I think that's one of the things we wring our hands about with these patients, right? Is not all of them have the T cell. Well, they all have T cell deficiency, but not all of them have the degree to which they'll get PJP like this patient did, but yet we put them all on, or we try to put them all on uh, Bactrim. Um, but yeah, I think they're, they're all kind of ticking time bombs. So it's a, it's a very reasonable question. And, and certainly this patient has profound T cell deficiency as part of his phenotype, right? Um, so I think, I think this question about transplant is, is valid. I think it's challenging because he is non-compliant and, you know, certainly post-transplant, he would have to be very compliant with follow-up and so forth. Um, especially if he's on immunosuppression, which he, he probably will be. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's the, 
it's the difficulty of a bad disease, um, not a great match scenario, it sounds like, and then uh, non-compliance. So. I mean, I think a lot of what we do in clinical immunology is cribbed off of the HIV literature. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a transplant. Just going back to the idea of prophylaxis, um, I think it is standard care in HIV to only start anti-cryptococcal prophylaxis after you've had cryptococcal meningitis. Um, but, but he didn't have meningitis, right? No. But given that PET scan, I would, I would still have started it. <laughs> pretty, pretty bad disease. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess um, Caitlin, you had brought up the possibility of gene therapy. Um, would that be better in a non-compliant person? Oh, that I don't know. <laughs> no. Sometimes I think, it, um, first of all, it's science fiction right now. Um, we don't know if we could do it in any I think that um, Troy Torgerson did some great work in, in mice. Um, um, but if we did do it in a human, I guess the benefit would be that you'd be taking the patient's own cells um, and modifying them, putting them back in. So I guess the risk of graft versus host disease would be reduced significantly. Graft rejection would be reduced significantly. And you probably wouldn't have to um, do full conditioning on him. So probably the risk of, of um, transplant-related infections would be less. Um, and Maybe and, and maybe that is the best hope because I I would I would think that if you wanted to condition a patient like this you'd really have to to go in and, and give him stronger therapy than you would for like a skid patient for instance maybe not full myeloblative but 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 something they knocked out his NK cells and his endogenous T cells and gosh at, after ten years of really poor um, adherence to prophylaxis, you kind of wonder what kind of bugs are sitting around in his nooks and crannies waiting to come out. He's CMV negative? Yeah, currently he is. Oh, wow. Okay. That's cool. Yeah, but the only prophylaxis he takes is Bactrim. Somehow he's very compliant with Bactrim, but um, the other like antiviral or antifungal we, um, you know, have, have been pre prescribing, but he hasn't been really compliant with it neither of them and IVIG uh, you know now I mean he we we lost him for about good five six months but now he's back and he's been getting monthly for past three months but it's very always um you know unreliable we never know when he's gonna disappear it I mean it's really not him it's his parents that um not really reliable so um yeah, I, I, I'm just wondering, like, whether you, anyone else has similar experience with um, patients having very poor socioeconomic status and um, how we can really help them for their best. I mean, I, I think one thing that you, that we've all probably done at transplant centers, a person like that, we have basically kept them in the hospital for six months for a couple of months before the transplant sort of optimizing them in six months after the transplant. Mm -hmm. um, and the Amish would not like that next. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of money. Um, but I think it's, it's the only way to remove the human error mm -hmm. variable, the, the, the parental non-compliance variable. Um, and it, it may be the only way a transplanter would agree to to attempting it um uh, um, what does the transplant team say um yeah they are still debating like and also the parents didn't really make a decision yet so um we are still kind of on the process of talking, but you know I'm really trying to you know get to the bottom of it you know before he you know, I don't want to go beyond 10 year old. If we're gonna do it, you know, I think we should really do it. Um, you know, before 10 or at 10 year old. So um there's some nice comments on the chat about an ethics board or getting religious leaders in, into the mix. Um, mm -hmm. great, uh, thank you, Terry. Mm -hmm. I think um th those are the sort of sort of, I think this is a soft. It's not going to be a, a right answer to your to your question. I think you know that. 
Mm -hmm. um, but um, ultimately, like a lot of what we do in medicine, it's like setting expectations. And mm -hmm. uh, I think the family should be aware that it, it may be, it may be, a, it may be the end of his life to attempt to transplant. Um, but um, if, if you don't do it, he probably doesn't have a, a, a bright future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Neil, and everyone for, you know, your discussion. Um, and I think it's nine o'clock now. So um, this is our last webinar for the year, as JP mentioned. Um, and hopefully we'll see many of you at the um, St. Louis for CIS annual meeting. And also back in September, we're going to have webinar back. Thank you, everyone. And thank you so much. Bye bye.